Welcome to the Like a Bird podcast. I'm James Chadwick, and throughout 2024, I'll be sharing one essay a week, or perhaps an interview, and then I'm rolling everything up into a second book, just in time for Christmas. But why Like a Bird? Well, it all started, as it often seems to do, with a single translated line that I couldn't get out of my head by the French poet and essayist Paul Valéry. One should be light like a bird and not like a feather. That line felt true and important. Yes, we should all want to grow lighter and be freer as we grow older, but lighter with control, like a bird in the air in flight and not like a feather buffeted around by the wind. That idea really seemed worth exploring, and it also resonated with a lot of experiences I'd been having through silent retreats and meditation, and generally making choices to simplify my own life. So, the Like a Bird weekly substack and this sister podcast is for everyone ready to grow lighter by gently cutting themselves free from the ideas, habits, and people that are weighing them down. Got any of those? I'm going to be writing about truth, love, books, friendship, addiction, raising boys, art, narcissism, wealth, and whatever else helps tells this story. Cutting free is not an easy thing to do, but I hope you find something useful here. And of course, welcome all and any comments. I'm always around working on various projects at jechadwick.com. So let's dive in to this week's idea. Welcome to episode two of Like a Bird. Have you ever had to navigate a narcissist at work or at home? How did it go? In what ways are you a narcissist? How might you make changes? Is society more narcissistic today and how and why? These are all things that we're going to explore in this essay, which is called How to Survive a Narcissist, Especially If It's You. And the subtitle is The Art of Looking into the Lake and Seeing Things as They Really Are. And we start with this great quote by Neil deGrasse Tyson, since the universe has no center, you can't be it. The first narcissist I had to navigate in the wild was an enormous, bald Dutch pharmaceutical expert called Bart Backer. It wasn't a very fair match. He was very clearly enjoying the tail end of his illustrious career with a lucrative expat China president posting to Shanghai, sent out from head office with deep experience to sell more drugs and generally terrorize the locals. I was still in my early 20s, a barely paid newspaper reporter from Hong Kong with zero business experience trying to kickstart my marketing career with a Chinese advertising agency. What could possibly go wrong? My first encounter with Bakker had not gone well. He needed to launch a new laxative drug before his competitors, and our job was to conduct consumer research to recommend how to advertise it. The problem wasn't the research. Our intrepid research team had diligently surveyed thousands of Chinese patients, and I came to the meeting armed with an encyclopedic knowledge of mainland bowel problems and constipation challenges. I literally knew my shit. Nope, the problem was me and my lack of meeting experience, and specifically my ignorance about dealing with that majestic beast, the business narcissist. I might have been better prepared if I'd started my career in the mailroom or taking coffee orders for the team and observing the grown-ups for a few years quietly from the back of the conference room, but instead I had been plucked prematurely from my career scribbling newspaper stories and thrust into the hot seat, expected to present and defend my recommendations with big, bald Bart Backer. My first meeting in Shanghai with his team started badly. And so you can see from this first slide, I will share the results from our study and make our recommendations about these four concepts. Backer has a question, he thundered. Pardon? Backer wants to ask a question. What? I didn't know what to do, so I just froze. And for far too long. Backer had a question. Was there another Backer in the room? Was the terrified Chinese lady sitting next to him Mrs. Backer, perhaps? It was certainly quite common for European expats to fall in love with and marry their assistants. Given his age, perhaps one of the spotty, skinny-tied fellows was son of Backer. Better stay quiet. Backer's question is why we only tested four concepts and not more, he shouted. Ah, so he was Backer after all. Now, I just had to ignore this oddness and attempt an answer. 
Well, we felt that more than four would be too many for the respondents to compare, and we did work with your team to select these concepts. He was not happy with this. In the glare of the projector beam, I noticed steam visibly wafting off his shiny head and saw that his team all had their faces down, pretending to take meeting notes, avoiding all eye contact. Backer disapproves. Backer says continue. And so it went on, slide after slide for hours. Backer disagrees. Backer objects. Backer cannot believe this number. Until finally, and to everyone's relief, Backer exits. We agreed with his team to come back with a new presentation the following week, and we filed out in silence and headed back to our office. The research was good. I felt I'd done. I felt I'd let my team down. By the time we reached our desks, my boss had already heard about the meeting and summoned me for a debrief. She was understanding, but clearly disappointed. And I promised her I would nail it next time. You'd better, because I'll need to be there now to make sure. She said and waved me out. For days, I tried to make sense of the meeting. Where did I go wrong? Why would anyone refer to themselves in the third person? What does it tell you about their character, and how should you deal with them? I started to develop a, th- a few theories. I decided that Backer had spent too long as an expat in China, when nobody dared to challenge his authority, and he'd become a business narcissist. He was an experiment in what happens when you take an overweight and probably oversexed middle-aged corporate man, separate him from his family and friends, and give him a kingdom to rule. He was Kurtz in the Heart of Darkness. He was Brando in Apocalypse Now. The horror. The horror. I would need to find a way to deal with him on his own terms. The day of the pre- next presentation arrived, and this time the stakes were raised. My boss would be watching, and my fledgling career was on the line. The lights went out, and I put up the first slide on the screen. Last week, we were not prepared for Backer. Backer was unhappy. Backer gave us wise advice based on his great knowledge of laxatives. Today, we have taken Backer's suggestions. And we hope to please Backer. I stopped there. It just sounded mad. I'd overdone the Backers. I was essentially presenting sarcastically to Yoda. I caught my boss's eye, and she looked horrified. Even the minions had stopped pretending to take notes and looked up horrified. Backer approves. He roared from the darkness with a single clap of his hands, and we were off. The meeting was a great success. Everyone was very relieved, including future generations of Chinese bowels. I learned that day that sometimes the best way to win over a man who has fallen in love with his own reflection is to just hold up a mirror for him to enjoy. But of course, that isn't always the best way to navigate the narcissists we meet. Sometimes they are our parents, or partners, or children, or even perhaps ourselves, and we need to understand how to navigate them sensitively. In the rest of this essay, I'll explore the myth, the condition, the good and the bad news. And finally, an antidote. Starting with the myth, it's surely worth taking a moment to enjoy the simple power of the Narcissus myth itself, which has survived for thousands of years. There are several different versions of the story, some of which focus more on Echo, the girl who fatally fell in love with Narcissus. But I prefer the Greek version that keeps its focus on the danger of the unexamined male ego. Narcissus' mother was warned by the seer Tiresias that her son would live a long life as long as he never knows himself. As her handsome lad grew up, he broke many hearts and caused great pain to women and men alike, but he never found love himself. Then one day, he caught his own reflection in a pool and fell in love with his own reflection. Like that friend we all know who never met a mirror or shop window he didn't love. Narcissus was unable to leave his own image in the pool, and he wasted away with unrequited love. His corpse rotted and became the beautiful flowers which today still bear his name. First, the good news. We are unlikely to waste away with self-love. If we do feel special and suspect that we might be some kind of narcissist, statistically speaking, we are in good company, as Rutger Bregman paradoxically notes. In the 1950s, only 12% of young adults agreed with the statement, I'm a very special person. Today, 80% do, when the fact is, we're all becoming more and more alike. We all read the same bestsellers, watch the same blockbusters, and sport the same sneakers. 
Moreover, narcissists appear to do rather well for themselves. In business, large companies still hunt out and overpay charismatic CEOs, and both Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos became the richest men on the planet. In politics, Donald Trump experimented with overt public narcissism and was elected to the White House with no political experience. In the mating game, it appears that narcissists are more interested in short-term relationships or hookups, and therefore almost certainly more successful at passing on their selfish genes. So narcissism perhaps even serves an adaptive function and it increased success in short-term mating. In other good news, most of us may be narcissists, but it's unlikely to be pathological. Narcissistic personality disorder a dysfunction which might manifest as lack of empathy, antagonism, grandiosity and attention-seeking only affects around 1% of the population, a level that's remained stable since clinicians started measuring it. Finally, there's some relief for parents who might fear that by showering their kids with unconditional love, they might be raising future narcissists. This is a common assumption that the most self-centred adults must have received too much love as children. Mothers of sons especially get the blame for raising little princes. But in Alain de Botton's professional opinion, the reverse is more likely to be true. He says, We may think of egoists as people who have grown sick from too much love, but the opposite is the case. An egoist is someone who has not yet had their fill. Self-centeredness has to have a clean run in the early years if it isn't to haunt and ruin the later ones. The so-called narcissist is simply a benighted soul who has not had a chance to be inordinately and unreasonably admired at the start. Now for the less good news. Our narcissistic blind spots often hold us back and cause suffering, both to others and ourselves, and especially when it comes to relationships. When we love something about ourselves so deeply that we always put it first, we cannot give our partners the love that they also need from us. It's as if we take their love, and instead of returning it or doubling it, we use it to feed our own self-love. At the beginning of a relationship, the things that make us special and the way we love ourselves for it can become irresistible to our partners. They might lack and crave these traits themselves, and therefore admire the natural confidence we have about them. But self-love is never enough to feed a life together, and if we refuse to know ourselves and adapt Relationships harden into stubborn defensiveness and ultimately break down. So now we've explored some of the good and the bad in our gentle narcissism, what might we do about it? The antidote to narcissism, ironically, is not, as Theresius warned, to never know yourself, but the very opposite. The earlier we can identify our special form of self-love, and we all have one, and perhaps understand where it comes from and accept it, the faster we can move on from it. We need to learn how to look into the lake and see not just our reflection, but actually see both the lake and our own self-love simultaneously. In other words, see things as they truly are. Our friends and family might guide us to know ourselves better, especially if we ask for their help. Often it's the very thing they've been teasing us about, which in itself is a gift of deep love. Feel free to pause here. Give your own self-love a name. Even write it down. Go on, this essay can wait. When we find it, we should first celebrate it. Because to love ourselves for at least one thing is better than to not love ourselves at all. And then after celebrating it, we might be honest about how it holds us back. How it might have frustrated our partners, ended friendships, cost us a job we had worked hard for. Then finally, we must learn how to tease ourselves about it. What would our bluntest school friend or sibling say about it? What would happen to us if we were a character in an episode of Seinfeld or The Simpsons? I mean, if we honestly think we're the smartest person in the room, when usually we're not, then that's pretty funny. If we always check out our left profile in every mirror, but never our right, that's also pretty promising comedy material. The wise, as they say, take the business of laughing at themselves very seriously. Whether we learn to laugh at ourselves privately, or even better, we learn to playfully tease ourselves publicly before other people even get a chance to, the outcome should be the same. 
if Narcissus had looked down at his reflection, pulled an ugly face and broken into uncontrollable laughter, there would have been a whole different ending and probably no myth or flowers to enjoy. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Like a Bird. Please subscribe to get one new idea a week. Check out more creative projects at jechadwick.com and share with anyone you think might be trying to grow lighter. And have a great light week. <laughs>